Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today is part two of looking at the summary judgment that was awarded in Megan's favor against Associated Newspapers. If you haven't watched part one, in which we discussed the first half, the privacy claim, then please watch that video before watching this one. And also, if you haven't watched the first video that I made on this topic, which will be linked in the description box, in that video, we talk about the background, all the facts, the causes of action, the arguments that were made by each side, and the relief sought. So if you have no context about this case whatsoever, then please also watch that one first before you watch part one, and of course, before you watch part two. Other than that, let's jump straight into the copyright claim. So Megan is claiming that the unlawful publication of her letter was also an infringement of her copyright since she is the original author of the letter. The defendant is relying on three main defenses. Firstly, reporting current events. Secondly, the public interest defense. And finally, the freedom of expression defense as stipulated by Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. It's also worth noting very early on in this video that even if Megan was not the sole author of this letter, there can be multiple authors to an original work and a separate copyright would exist attached to each of these authors. It is worth noting though that Megan is claiming to be the sole author. So a major component of the defendant's argument is that Megan consulted the Kensington Palace communications team to write the letter, particularly one, Mr. Knopf. I'm not sure, again, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but forgive me if it's a wrong pronunciation. So the defendant contends that Mr. Knopf in particular contributed enough to the letter that he would be deemed a co-author. Now in the UK, if a member of the royal household or basically a staff member of the royal family owns something, for example, in copyright, as long as it's actually created in the course of their employment in their position as a staff member rather than in a personal capacity, then it is actually crown copyright. So in this instance, for example, the crown or the queen would own the copyright, not Mr. Knopf. So the defendant is stating that based off this reasoning, the letter has a crown copyright. Now, it is important to note that the defendant has no definitive proof that Mr. Knopf co-authored the letter. So it is merely speculation at this point. However, apparently the defendant has a source who is a senior member of the royal household who told them that Mr. Knopf worked on several drafts of the letter with Meghan Markle. This source also states that the Palace Four, Kensington staff, have evidence to prove this. The defendant also stated that it is prepared to summon Mr. Knopf for evidence if necessary. There is also a letter that was provided to the defendant from a law firm, Adelshaw Goddard, that represents the Kensington Palace staff. The letter essentially states that while the clients, being the Kensington Palace staff, want to remain neutral and don't want to take sides or assist any particular party's case, they are willing to assist the court in any way that they can by shedding light on the issue of ownership if possible. So the judge decided that the defendant's case on this matter is not fanciful and warrants progression, not to a full trial of all the issues, but a mini trial of sorts just to deal with this particular issue of ownership. As far as the impact that this issue will have on the overall case, it would only affect the extent to which Megan can establish infringement of her copyright and the remedies that she can recover. There is no room for doubt that the defendant's conduct involved an infringement of copyright of which the claimant was the owner or at worst, a co-owner. All this to say that the judge believes that just in this particular issue of ownership, of whether Megan is the sole owner or a co-owner, the judge is willing to hear the defendant out because their case is not fanciful. They have a reasonable prospect potentially to present evidence to prove this fact. But as we stated earlier, at the end of the day, you can still be a co-author and bring forth a copyright claim because a separate copyright attaches to each author. The only difference it would make is the amount that Megan can claim in remedies. All right, moving on to all the other issues that were indeed resolved 
in this judgment. The defendant raised the issue of originality of the letter and infringement. So the defendant denies that the letter was an original work purely because it was an admonishment of her father and a recitation of pre-existing facts. However, the judge noted that no authority was cited for this argument. So essentially, as the judge pointed out, the defendant seems to be arguing that unless the claimant proves that what she wrote was to some extent fiction, her case must fail. And this is really ironic when you consider the fact that the defendant is a newspaper, right? And so a substantial portion of their job is to report on pre-existing facts. A story happens and then they subsequently report on it. So they're claiming essentially that pretty much most articles that report on pre-existing facts, things that have happened, are not protected by copyright. Only works of fiction, according to the defendant, is protected by copyright, which is of course ludicrous. And the judge found it to be so and rejected the argument. So the letter was deemed to be an original work and it was infringed upon unlawful publication. The next argument put forth was that of fair dealing, which I believe is known as fair use in the US. I'm sure you would have watched thousands of YouTube videos by now where the creator of the video states that they are using footage from other creators or from other sources legally because it falls under fair use. So an example of fair use is for educational purposes or when you're critiquing or commenting on someone else's work. So as long as you're not literally just copy pasting someone else's work and not contributing to it, then you have an argument for fair use. So the defendant is relying on this argument of fair dealing, which is very confusing to me because they merely just published excerpts of it as a way for Mr. Markle to supposedly respond to the People magazine article. Now the judge noted that there is no hard and fast definition of what constitutes fair dealing in the UK, but the case law provides these following factors as a guideline. First of all, whether the alleged fair dealing is in fact commercially competing with the proprietor's exploitation of the copyright work or is a substitute for the probable purchase of authorized copies. If so, then the defense fails. So basically, if you copy someone else's work to directly compete with them in a commercial sense, or if, for example, with pirated movies, you basically just, again, copy their work and sell it without really tweaking it or adding any input to it whatsoever, you're just selling it as is for a cheaper price or for your profits, then that is not fair dealing. Now, the judge noted that, of course, this first factor does not apply because we're not dealing with commercial competitiveness in this instance. The second factor is whether the work has already been published or otherwise exposed to the public. If it has not, and especially if the material has been obtained by a breach of confidence or other means or underhand dealing, the courts will be reluctant to say this is fair. And this is exactly the situation we're dealing with here. As we established in part one, this letter was never in the public domain until the defendant published it. And they did so without consent. And then the third most important factor is the amount and importance of the work that has been taken. Although it is permissible to take a substantial part of the work, in some circumstances, the taking of an excessive amount or the taking of even a small amount on a regular basis would negative fair dealing. So the court acknowledges here that sometimes you can use a substantial part of the work and still fall under fair dealing, which is the example I just gave you of YouTubers using other YouTubers footage to make documentaries or commentary videos about them. But in this instance, as pointed out by the judge, the defendant copied a large and important portion of the work's original literary content. And so the defendant failed in this instance. And then finally, we have public interest and freedom of expression under Article 10. The court stated that there is no basis on which this court could conclude that although the copying of the work was not fair dealing for news reporting purposes, 
the public interest requires the copyright to be overridden. So basically he's saying that because the fair dealing defense failed and it was not found to be reporting on current events, then how could public interest prevail? And we already talked extensively about public interest in part one, which is that a curiosity, being nosy and wanting to know about people's private matters does not satisfy or does not qualify as public interest. And so this defense of public interest failed, mainly for the same reasons that we discussed in part one, and also here additionally because the fair dealing defense and reporting of current events defense failed as well. All right, so that's it for the judgment. So what's next? A spokesman for the defendant said that we are surprised by the summary judgment and disappointed at being denied the chance to have all the evidence heard and tested in open court at a full trial. We are carefully considering the judgment's contents and will decide in due course whether to lodge an appeal. So they're leaving it open. Now, we do know that they have 21 days from the date of the judgment to lodge an appeal. Now, because there are still outstanding issues to be resolved, mainly the copyright ownership, the case isn't really over yet. And so that's going to play a part in the appeal because the defendant may want to wait on a ruling pertaining to ownership before they lodge an appeal because they may get an unfavorable ruling on that aspect as well. And so, of course, you have one shot at an appeal. So you don't want to risk leaving one matter out and appealing the rest of it when you could potentially also want to appeal that matter, being the ownership. A date for a hearing on the 2nd of March has been set by the judge to consider remedies and costs. And then possibly that hearing would also consider what will be done in terms of setting a date for the ownership trial. I have received questions on whether Megan can just drop this outstanding claim of ownership and just be happy with what she has gotten. But the thing is, the whole issue of copyright has already been addressed quite substantially in the judgment. And it has been found that there has been a copyright infringement. And the judge made it clear in his judgment that the defendant wants to pursue this. So because judgment has already been made pertaining to copyright, and because this concept of co-ownership will affect the remedies that she can claim, it's not really something that can just be dismissed. But at the end of the day, Megan has won. She is a member of the royal family. She is quite affluent. And so at the end of the day, I think what matters to her is just winning, not the amount of damages that she can claim. And before I end the video, I thought I'd put up Megan's statement that she released after this victory. Feel free to pause the video to read it in your own time. Quickly on my personal thoughts, I think I have made it quite clear in the last two videos pertaining to this topic that... I was in favor of the claimant, Meghan Markle, because what was done to her was wrong and absolutely uncalled for. And I would also like to reiterate that this is not bias. This could have been anyone in Meghan's shoes and I would have arrived at the same decision personally. At the end of the day, we have to remember that these people are human beings and they have feelings and they have fears and they have insecurities and issues with their family members, issues with their friends. They are just like us. They just happen to be in the public sphere, but that doesn't deprive them of their right to privacy. There is no exception in Article 8 that this right to privacy does not apply to people who are public figures. So the law recognizes that public figures are entitled to their privacy as well. As I said in part one, please don't let your personal opinions and preconceived notions and feelings towards Meghan Markle color your perception of this case. Try to see it from an objective viewpoint. Put anyone else in that situation and see whether you still think they deserve to have their privacy infringed upon like that and their copyright as well. Other than that, Please don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. A very special thank you to my patrons. Stay safe and I'll catch you in a future video.